Hello, good morning. Welcome to the second day of the GeekWire Summit. This has been a really great summit, and, and in large part because of all of you attendees. This is numerically speaking, in terms of attendees walking in through the door, our largest summit yet. So this is really great because we've always wanted to fulfill this vision of the GeekWire Summit being a national level uh, conference, and um, I think that we've done that this year. So thank you to all of you. So this particular breakfast panel, thank you for being here for, for this specific panel, because it's, it's, it's an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. It's very near and dear to GeekWire's heart. And it's something that I wanted to sort of explicitly express, is that diversity and inclusion, it's something that we actually work very, very hard on. And we don't really talk about it enough, probably, but every single conference we work hard to make sure that underrepresented uh, groups are, in fact, represented and, um, uh, and that they're given a vis visibility that they deserve um, and a voice. And so I'm proud to actually report that this GeekWire Summit, we were at, um, the actual number is 43% female speakers, which is our highest to date. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. That's, um, I appreciate the acknowledgement that that's, while that's not, it's, you know, we still have some uh, room to go uh, to be 50-50 or pay, perhaps even 65-35 uh, uh, in the future. Um, it's, it's, it's a great step. And for the first time, we've also had a number of um, immigrant tracks where really amazing folks like Leslie Feinzig and Ritu Gupta and others could talk about their immigrant stories and the value of um, this country um, uh, being open to their families immigrating here and the amazing value that they've created since they've been here. So I think that that's also very important. Um, another thing that I want to briefly touch on is um, uh, to underscore how near and dear to my heart this issue is, is this book that I've written, um, which will be due out on shelves on December 6th. It's a book that I've written. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's called Better Together, and it's eight ways working with women leads to extraordinary profits and results. And so uh, that's, that's my publisher's uh, urging to, to use that title. But really, I talk about my own experiences building companies and why you can unlock, in a tremendous, unlock a tremendous amount of value if you have men and women working together equally, collaboratively, creating great products. And so uh, you can actually pre-order it right now on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. So uh, appreciate you taking a listen to that. So I think it's actually very, very appropriate that the sponsor of this particular panel is the Zillow Group. Um, I say this all the time, and I've said this to the moderator of this panel, Amy Butinsky, that when I look at all of the companies in our ecosystem, and first of all, I think we can be very proud of Seattle as a tech ecosystem. The fact that Bloomberg TV is here and other national level news organizations is here covering this event testifies to the fact that we are just as important a, a tech ecosystem as uh, down in the Bay Area or anywhere else. But when I look at the Seattle tech ecosystem, I think of just a handful of companies who are doing amazing things and who are doing things right and who are serving as a shining example of how to be inclusive, how to be collaborative, and how to do things in a way that's th where, where we support a culture of collaboration and, um, uh, uh, and supportiveness. And when I look at those companies, there are just a handful of people leaders at those companies whom I feel like are inspiring, who are setting a great example. And um, I say all the time to Amy that I'm always so jealous of the sort of Camelot that I feel like that she has with her colleagues at, at the Zillow Group, and I see many of them also here. Um, you know, additional nights at a round table, if you will, if I extend that metaphor. So um, I would like to welcome Amy Butinsky, our, current, our sponsor of this panel, and also the COO of Zillow. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody to the stage, our moderator. Thank you, Jonathan, for that intro. And I think I can truly say I have never had at a tech conference a sharper dressed intro. So, <laughs> um, And thank you, GeekWire, for having this panel and all of the diverse panels that we've had over the last couple of days. Um, it means a lot to see this. It means a lot to see this room full. And yes. we have a lot we can talk about today. Um, I am super excited, though, first and foremost, about our panelists. We have a diverse panel with a lot of diverse backgrounds, um, points of view, um, and a lot of different places we can take this. So I'm excited where the next 45 minutes or so we're going to go. So let me introduce my panelists. Um, first, on my left, is Ephanis Henderson. He spent 40 years at Weyerhaeuser in various uh, 
HR leadership roles, the last decade of that primarily focused on diversity and inclusion. And when he left there in 2013, um, he founded the nonprofit Institute for S Sustainable Diversity and Inclusion, and he's also president and COO of Henderworks, which is a consulting firm that works with companies to think deeply about diversity and inclusion and how to implement this within their organizations. So um, FNS has a long um, history and experience in DNI that I think we don't see very often in tech, and I'm super happy to have his uh, uh, knowledge and input today. We also have Sarah Bird, uh, CEO of Moz. She's been there since the very beginning for seven years. Um, she's not only COO, she, or CEO, she's a board member. Um, and outside Moz is also on the board of WTIA, so pretty deeply embedded in the Seattle tech scene. And then Eric Osborne. Uh, Eric is the co-founder of Here Seattle. And if you haven't interacted with Here Seattle, they are a terrific organization um, that helps minorities in the creative and tech industries um, with networking events, with understanding their opportunities. They're a terrific resource for companies if you're thinking about diversity and inclusion with your own company. Um, and he has a lot of observation and a lot to share with us today. So thank you all for being here. And let's give him a round of applause for being here. Thank you. Um, and I think I just want to start today with a really basic question because I think often this isn't covered in tech. We see a lot of headlines about diversity data and the numbers, but what's often just kind of skipped over is the why. So I wanted to start, and I wanted to start with you, FNS, because of, of your years of experience in this. Um, why is this important, and why should this be important to every person in this room and their employer? Well, first of all, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I'd also, as uh, co-director of the Institute for Sustainable Diversity, would like to introduce my partner, Barbara Dean, who's sitting up front, mm -hmm. uh, because she is essentially a person who's done quite a bit of work over the years in uh, teaching uh, representatives and corporations here in the Northwest about diversity and inclusion. So thank you, Barbara. Um, what I would say, first of all, why diversity is important. Uh, if you look at the demographic, demographic change in the U.S. and around the world, uh, you'll find that we're very quickly becoming a majority minority nation, particularly in urban centers. And so if you're really interested in attracting the best and brightest talent starting there, uh, you're going to have to be much more inclusive about you know, who you attract, where you, where you uh, source those individuals from, and, and so forth. Uh, we know about the, the innovation, it's the right thing to do, government compliance, but from our studies um, and from the studies that we've read from Deloitte and others, you know, diversity is a competitive advantage. Those organizations that get it right really have better results, uh, have better engagement of employees, and really can and produce and share service and product to a wide array of diverse consumers, both here in the U.S. and around the world. It's, it's significant to sustainability, and that's why we call our institute the Sustainable uh, Institute for, uh, for Diversity and Inclusion, because if you really want to be sustainable, you know, you really do need to get this, this right. So I'll just stop there. And, and Sarah, from your experience starting and scaling a company, mm -hmm. um, what has it meant to you all and why is it important to your company? Uh, I wouldn't echo some of the same things that have already been said. One, just because it's the morally right thing to do, to see every human for their potential and to give them dignity and respect. I think that's, that's an obvious one. Um, and second, of course, um, there are better ideas. I don't think any of us want to purposefully live where all we hear is our own ideas reflected back to us. And so you are missing out on the breadth of human experience unless you invite those other perspectives in and give them a platform to speak. And so it's very important for innovation and for success to have a diversity of viewpoints and backgrounds. Um, we, have seen, we have seen some examples lately where companies have stumbled into, wow, that ad campaign? Oh, yes. Really? Wow, why didn't anyone in the room say, you know, that doesn't land well with yes. everyone? And so it's, there's, there's a little almost risk management piece of it, right? I, don't, don't accidentally believe yourself and, the, and, and be blind to the potential consequences of your message or your actions. So diversity helps, helps with that. Um, and then third, of course, the talent shortage, right? Uh, it's hard to get talent here. It's going to continue to be hard to get talent. If we don't give everyone an opportunity to excel, we're going to have a real problem. 
I think if you want to get a little apocalyptic, you can even go, hey, there's this major technology transformation happening. And if we don't solve the diversity issue, we are going to have a major, much worse social crisis on our hand, right? We have problems today, and it's going to get worse unless we learn to bring in a broader group of humans and give them the chance to succeed in this new economy with these new skills and these new ways of thinking. So we, it's already a big challenge and a problem, and it's going to get worse as this technology wave continues. Um, to continue to roll through our society. So uh, several layers of that, right? Mm. And then I think <clears throat> you said it really well. I mean, I think history has shown what happens when we leave large populations out yeah. of the changes. Um, we know that with, with factories and everything moving over to overseas and things like that, the, a lot of the communities that was built around those went into shambles, and those, those communities are still recovering today from those things. So with that said, I mean, tech, tech as we call it an industry, it's really interesting because it's actually in every single industry, right? It's in every single thing we do, it's technology. So with that said, if we continue to go on this path where we're leaving all these people out, we're going to have a huge problem down the road. It's one of those things where, it will come back on you in the long run, no matter what. And we know this from history repeating itself over and over and over and over again. So that's, I mean, literally, I think from the moral, we know it's better business, uh, better business, we know that you profit more, all those different things are actual facts. But then beyond that, it's a societal thing about taking people and bringing them with you as you have this, as you grow, and this industry is growing like crazy. That's where all the jobs are. So help people um, be better and, and become a part of this industry. So we've seen a lot of tech companies over the last three, four, five years really put a stake in the ground and say, we care about a diversity. Here's our numbers. Here's how they're changing or not changing year after year. And, and you really see tech companies struggle with recruiting and hiring diverse populations. Um, what do you say to those who say it's a pipeline problem? Well, well I'll, I'll just start by saying that it's a change management problem. And most organizations, most tech companies haven't really spent a lot of time, I don't believe, uh, in the area of organizational change. This is work that requires a, a sustained effort over time. Uh, it is clearly a pipeline problem. Oftentimes what we see are people focusing in on planning a variety of events and assuming that people of color, underrepresented minorities, and other group-based identity, uh, folks with different uh, backgrounds and so forth will actually come. But it's, it's really about how do you create an inclusive culture in your organization so, feel, so people will feel like they're being respected, they feel a sense of belonging, and they feel that it's a place that they would like to work. And it's, it's not just about recruiting, but it's really how to create that kind of environment in a way that everyone uh, excels. For me, the concept of diversity is really about the mix of characteristics, attributes, and behaviors, the things that people, everyone, bring to the workplace. It's not just about women. It's not just about people of color. It's about how do you take the rich diversity, even thinking styles, cognitive, diversity is an area. Inclusion is about how do you take that diverse set of characteristics and attributes and make it work to create greater products, greater services, better innovation. And so it's how do you create the systems, the processes, uh, and you, the behaviors that are going to be important in employees in creating a respectful and inclusive environment. Yeah, I mean, let's pause on that for a moment, the inclusion side, because I think so much when you see media coverage of diversity and inclusion, it's really on the diversity side, right? Tech companies are struggling or, or starting to hire more diverse populations, but when you dig in, um, are those diverse populations staying, right? And, and, and are companies able to retain um, women and minorities? And um, do these people feel like they belong? So I would love, you know, Sarah and, and Eric, if you could talk a bit about what does inclusion mean? And for people here, um, are there actionable things or ways that people can think about going back to their companies, what inclusion means? I, I, um, I'm going to start with a, 
a confession, a personal confession, and then I'll move to a couple of actionable tips. So um, it's a pipeline problem and also an inclusion problem. So that's a yes and response. And I, my confession is that um, for me, and I think for many, many, many companies, the pipeline problem feels easier because it's outside you. I think the hardest work of inclusion is inside your own company and your own teams and between humans and how do you have highly, highly um, functional collaborative conversations about race, about sexism, about how we treat people, all of those stuff that, in, that engages sort of identity politics in folks. That is, I think, really, really hard work. And I think for me, I have found it is much easier to go say, hey, let's go find a way to support uh, wonderful organizations out there doing great work because it truly will help. All of these great organizations that are helping increase our pipeline, that's real. So it's, I, I can feel good about myself. Yay, Sarah, we've supported another wonderful you know, incubator educational program to get inclusive people here. Um, I find the hardest work is the hearts and minds of people in your company because we're all humans and we all bring our stuff and we hurt each other's feelings all the time, and th but that is the stuff that makes a safe organization. So you asked me though for some practical tips. I wanna give one for, um, one for employees. This is something you can practice saying, and that's, um, we don't do that here. This is a really powerful one little liner. When you see something, and especially if there's like a power differential or someone on another team, and you don't want to engage in a, hey, I think that's racist, or I think that's rape culture, or I'm really offended that you think that someone else's abilities, you know, artists, their potential is less than mine based on how they dress today. Um, those are hard conversations to have, right? Because no one wants to be labeled a racist or a sexist. It's very triggering. I don't like it. I don't like being called that. It's very triggering. But when you can say to someone, oh, we don't say those things here. We don't do that here. You don't have to have the conversation about, are you right, did you mean it? Of course you didn't mean it, I'm sure you didn't mean it. You know, you're a good no. human, you know, just, but we don't do that here. No. Simple, done. We don't have to have the big, we just don't, well, here we don't do that. So that's a little gift for individual employees <coughs> who are for those interactions, because I think, like I said, for me, that is the harder to solve problem. Um, and I think about like what's ha what the what happened at Uber, you know, all those employees. Like, how do they how do they handle that? So that's one for employees. For those of us who are privileged enough to be in power and to have some responsibility, I think there is um, obviously we've got to have more courage. We've got to have more leadership. We've got to. There is an invitation right now in our culture to step into this conversation with bravery, and um, many people are missing it, mm -hmm. and that's a loss. That's a loss, right? So we got to step in proudly and confidently and say, hey. That's not the, that's, those are not our values here. In my company, this is what we value. And we protect everyone's right to express themselves and to be safe, right? We, we've gotta step into that rather than, I think, a mythology that leaders can't bring anything that smells political into the office. That's a silencing measure. So I think there's some courage. There's a couple legal mechanisms, right? I think, um, is Christina Bergman in the office? She did a great article on GeekWire this summer about boards and board composition <coughs> and how you gotta make sure your voting agreements allow you to fire someone who is sexually harassing or a bad actor on your board so that you don't run, you, surprisingly, it's actually hard to get someone who's a sexual harasser off your board. It's not considered oh. for cause. So there are some legal things you can do in your agreements with your board members at the highest level to make sure that you don't have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that someone is bad for your company to get them off the board when these things are involved. Also in how we do non-disclosure agreements, we need to think very carefully about the use of non-disclosure agreements as, as leaders and as people who manage risk, that non-disclosure agreements have been used to perpetuate abuse and abusers and keep them in the system, and that's a problem. I love NDAs. I am, a, I am an attorney by background, and we use NDAs at Moz. This is not a down with NDAs conversation, but it is a let's be way more thoughtful about how we deploy them and give out so that it doesn't excuse repeated bad behavior. So like a couple things sort of, you know, trying to think on an individual human level, but also on a leadership risk management thing you can do today in your company level. Uh, Sarah, on the subject of, of the conversations, because I think there's so much rich dialogue there, and I know, Eric, there's a lot you can add to this. Mm -hmm. um, something that was eye-opening for me a couple years ago uh, at Zillow Group was, it was when there were um, race riots happening in Baltimore, yeah. and we had an, an African-American employee share that um, this person came into work, and this was something that was impacting this person in, in um, 
social circles and family and something he was talking about a lot and came into work and people were still talking about sports yeah. and Star Wars and sort of all the techie things we talk about and not one person that day acknowledged mm -hmm. this is happening. Um, and you know we've been through a couple years now where a this is happening is happening all the time oh. in ways that, that impact our LGBTQ populations, mm -hmm. our women, our, our ethnic diversity populations, our immigrant populations. Mm -hmm. um, and something that I've heard from many, many leaders is struggling with when and how do I talk yeah. about this? Um, mm. yeah. So, I mean, I guess the thing with pipeline, because I, I always hear pipeline. And so the first thing I want to say on that is that we could say that there is a pipeline issue, right? There isn't, you know, minorities um, graduating in computer science like white males or things like that. We could say that, right? <coughs> but there are people graduating, and those numbers aren't still going up. So it's the people that are graduating that are consistently not getting in the industry as well. So that's. We can continue to say that as a pipeline industry, but I think that it's, it's more of a perception too, because us on the minority community don't feel like the tech industry accepts us or wants us, right? So we go to school, we do these things, and then we try to get a job, and the interview process and everything else is, I think, more at, it's more to weed people out than include people from the very beginning of the process to the very end from that. So I think we can continue to say that it's a pipeline issue, but it's until we start actually making some movement on these numbers with the people that we have in the industry, then I think we got to, that's just an excuse and a cop out. I do want to say that because I, we created here in Seattle to, and this is, this goes into the inclusion question. One of the things that people, actually on step people can do for inclusion is get involved outside of your neighborhood. Get involved with other communities. We created here Seattle, and we started it, and it was a predominantly African-American community, and we were becoming part of this problem. And we mindfully went out to seek out other populations so that we can create a diverse group of people. We wanted a place in Seattle so that everybody could come and be their authentic self, correct? Outside of work, and you can meet friends there. It's great for everyone in this room to be in those type of environments so that you can actually experience it, then go back and actually realize that, wow, this is actually really good. Being part of a lot of things that goes on in our country is we hear things from other sources and, and the media and all this stuff, and we get a little bit afraid of other groups. Um, I myself, I've had an opportunity to be around a lot of people that in times I felt really uncomfortable. You know, um, LGBTQ, that whole sector for me in the beginning of doing this was very uncomfortable because I just never been around a lot of uh, transgender um, people myself. But being on panels and things like that, once um, someone said to me, they, they were answering a question and they said that the bathrooms and things like that is very uncomfortable for them. And it was great for me to hear that, and I would have never heard that if I wasn't around this person. But it was great for me to hear that because I never even thought about it. I literally, I'm a, I'm a minority, and I know we have all our issues, but then here's this group, and I never even thought about it. So I think a huge thing for all of you in this room, if you care about diversity and inclusion, actually get out and get, become a part of some communities outside of your own. If you continue to have these, these the same people around you reinforcing the same things, you never really get out and, and actually experience what true America is because we know it's not that, right? Yeah. So I think that's a huge action step and probably one of the best you could do is actually get out and start working there or being a part of different communities that don't look like the ones you're always a part of. Mm -hmm. There are churches, there are, if you're spiritual, there are churches, there are networking events, there are a lot of different things for you to get a, to be a part of this and actually and you can actually start referring people from those groups into your company and actually make some difference as well. So, and then on the inclusion side, I think it's a personal thing. I mean, I think with all of this, with diversity and inclusion, it's very personal. And things only, it really <coughs> sucks, but things only matter when they hit your family or your house or your um, neighborhood and those type of things. So 
it's something that's very personal and it has to be personal to you. And I know a lot of women um, in this room, they're, when I talk to them, they're really passionate about this. Why? Because they've had struggles in it. So on the other side, the people who are not struggling, the people on power, get in these communities, start hearing some of these conversations so you can be like, wow, I never even knew that this was like that. On the, on the pipeline um, thing, I love Monique Franklin, who, who uh, is a diversity and inclusion program manager for us, I think said it really well um, within our company of, if you have a pipeline problem, find a bigger or different pipeline. Exactly. It's true. And you know, at, in tech, we tend to go to the same schools, right? The same companies we recruit from. Um, and it's work to broaden that. Uh, maybe, Efinas, uh, do you have anything on that in your time? Yes, I, I, I have a couple of comments, so let me just start. I'd just like to ask the audience a question very quickly. How many of you are leaders that supervise other people? Let me see, see a show of hands. Okay, so first of all, let me just talk about inclusion starts with you as a leader in your organization. There are three levels of responsibility, as I would describe it, as you think about diversity. It's an individual level, that's your own behaviors, how you're setting the tone, holding people accountable, inspecting results. Um, it's also on the team level, you know, how are you engaging and creating teams, uh, innovation teams, ideation teams? Are you saying, I don't care who you have on the team, I just expect that team to be a diverse team of people that represent a variety of points of view and perspectives, functions, uh, backgrounds and so forth. And then if you're a corporate uh, leader that has responsibility for system-wide implications in terms of, uh, of human resources policies, for example, the question is, what are you, being, what are you doing to be intentional <coughs> about ensuring that your practices, your processes, and your activities are inclusive? Because oftentimes, the reason why you're not building a more diverse and inclusive organization isn't necessarily because you don't feel it in your heart and you have the commitment personally, but you really haven't looked at your processes, your talent acquisition, your talent development, your succession. We talked about pipeline. Oftentimes a lot of folks uh, will say in organizations that, well, we promote from within. So have you looked at your succession planning processes? Who's in those feeder jobs? Where are there gaps in terms of utilization, in terms of, let's say, people of color? Perhaps you focused on gender diversity uh, and haven't really uh, been intentional about um, your strategies for attracting people of color. Or if you're attracting people of color, perhaps you have a very narrow uh, view of uh, people of color. You would say, I, I have good representation, but you all, your representation of minorities, of is of one uh, minority group as opposed to the diversity even of diversity. Mm -hmm. So part of it is, I would say, looking at your own personal behavior. What we found in terms of inclusive leadership, th four behaviors that were very important. Trust, you know, people have to trust that you're doing the right thing. So what you say has to align with what you're doing, right? Two, expanding circles of influence. You can't just stay in your same echo chamber. What are the different points of view and perspectives that are gonna be important for this problem, this solution, this service? And you actively and intentionally go out and do that. Commitment, speak to your commitment to this area. Oftentimes people will say, I think my leader is supportive, but it's never been on an agenda. It's never been a, an expectation when there has been an inappropriate behavior occurring, they have not challenged that behavior and said that we don't do that here. So those are the kinds of things. And then the whole issue of providing opportunity for growth and development. Using concepts like the Rooney Rule, where you say, I don't care who you select for these positions, all I require, particularly if it's an area where you're really striving to be, become more inclusive and diverse, is to say that I expect that you'll have a diverse set of candidates for this job. Those are some of the things that uh, I think people can do to, to build the pipeline and so forth. But oftentimes it's, if you always do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. So, I mean, you've got to step out of your echo chamber and mindsets and, and think differently about this topic. 
I do think that echoing the leadership is very, very important. Um, leadership on, on teams, leadership being an example, being a part of the different employee resource groups as a leader, going, being a part of it, giving people opportunity and time to actually attend these meetings and things like that are all very important. And a lot of times, and I, I come from the lens of, of the community, and the community with companies that I deal with that aren't having a lot of high engagement, it's because on a management level, they don't have the time and they don't feel comfortable asking for the time. So as a leader, leaders, you should be letting your employees know that this is, this is okay. We, we want you to go to this. We want you to be a part of this and, and allow them to feel comfortable um, doing these type of things. Um, I also hear from a lot of recruiters, internal recruiters. And so on a leadership level, managers who are actually hiring people, like Effin has said, you have a opportunity. You really have an opportunity as a decision maker. You have an opportunity to diversify your teams. What I hear from recruiters that, and I have recruiters that have switched companies and things that, uh, yeah, I know we talk about diversity, but when it's so tough to get a person of color or a woman through this system, mm -hmm. through the channels, where, wherever that channel is, at some point, it's going to hit this point, and the hiring manager or the leader of that team that's looking for that person is not really focused on diversity or don't really care about it at all. And so that's what I'm hearing from a lot of recruiters. These are actual people who are working in the industry. They're getting really frustrated from a recruiting side because on the top, in the media, they're saying, oh, we want diversity, we want diversity. But here, through the level, it's getting blocked throughout. And so leaders, hiring managers, you guys, you have a real, in a sense, responsibility to be a part of this um, on a personal level, your teams, all those different things. So, Sarah, how has the role of CEO changed and what are people <coughs> wanting from CEOs and, and leadership today around this topic? Um, I don't know what people want. I'm not entirely interested in whether or not people want to know the values of the org. The org has values. Whether people really want to hear them, I guess. I, I think some people would prefer, I, I, so let me say that differently. I know some people are very uncomfortable when you have conversations about race and sexism and what's happening on a broader national level inside your company. It makes people really uncomfortable. And um, it takes courage for me to still comment and engage in that way because I know it's gonna make some people uncomfortable. So I, uh, one, I give myself pep talks about courage. And two, I remind myself that Moz, thank goodness, we've always been on the records that we are a very values-driven organization and we are annoyingly public about our values. And I, I remind people consistently and for myself, I try to draw a line between, there's no political test to be in this company and that's true. There is a values test. There's always been a values test. There will always be a values test no matter what's happening on the broader scale. And those values have to do with dignity, equality, helping humans reach their potential, and that you've gotta be part of that. And one of the other values is also around compassion and forgiveness, which is an important tool in this conversation, right? Because when you're managing people, or you yourself, you're a manager. I flubbed up the other day in my manager's meeting. It was so embarrassing, guys. We were talking about recruiting, <laughs> and it was an important strategic executive role, of which there aren't many. So when you get an executive role open, you got to work extra hard to try to make it diverse. And we had been waiting a long time, hadn't had a candidate, and I, I was not in my best self, and I made a comment about the reason we were not going to move to that next round of um, interviews was because we didn't have enough diverse candidates, and I said something like, I don't want to hire the first old white guy um, I see, which is, isn't that awful? I'm so embarrassed <laughs> by that. That was not my best self. I don't like to think that way. And I, and I could have said that in a, a much better, more compassionate way that preserves everyone's dignity about this. I was, there's a great point to be made about, hey, the, your, your first candidate is likely to be a white male because that's the numbers game. And so for an executive role, you're likely to have that and they're likely to be older because they would have had years of experience. There's a great way to have that conversation and I blew it right in front of my managers. Mm. I heard it come out of my mouth. I kept going. I reflected on it all afternoon. I was like, oh, God, that is not how I want people to treat people. And, uh, and then had to do a big mea culpa. I remember, I reminded myself that there is an opportunity to show leadership in asking for forgiveness and for apologizing when you flub up. <laughs> and I said, you know what? 
Um, I want to I want to show the manager team how you apologize when you make a mistake, because that's a really important part of leadership. And in this journey, uh, <laughs> there is going to be lots of opportunities for y'all to flub up. And I and I so I stepped into that and I just said, look, I managers. What happened yesterday, this is what I said, I don't like it, it's not our values, I hold myself to a higher standard, that's not, we can, we can further our goals of diversity and inclusion without denigrating anyone else, mm -hmm. so uh, I apologize, I apologize, and I won't do it again. If you hear me do it again, call me out. That's not, that's not how I wanna be. So I, I, I give that to you as, <laughs> as, a, uh, as a reminder of some of the ways you step into these kind of conversations and show leadership and whether or not someone wants to hear it or not. Some people weren't offended at all, they were like, oh no, I thought it was awesome, I'm like, well, but I don't want you to think it's awesome, you know? Jeez, you could be kind to everyone. We should be kind to everyone, you know? It's, what the Dalai Lama says, you should um, be kind whenever possible, and it is always possible. God, I love that, right? Yeah. Um, well, I think yeah. something that holds leaders back sometimes from having these conversations is fear of saying something wrong, yeah. or phrasing something yeah. wrong, or saying yeah. something polarizing that makes one group feel good and one group feel bad. What advice would any of you give to leaders on how to open themselves up to having these conversations? Barbara and I are working on a, uh, a whole series for next year on what we call being an inclusion provocateur. And that's sort of the theme. And beneath that is bridging the human divides. And what we're seeing uh, across America is, is growing polarization, for one. And so we're actually working with a consultant who has a background in what, what's called polarity management, uh, when you have two different, very ex extremely different points of view and perspectives about an issue. How do you bring people together at the table to have a, a courageous conversation because it's very uncomfortable. Many of us live and, and work in, in echo chambers with people very similar to us that are like-minded. Like my sense is that as we go forward, we're going to see increasingly a greater level of diversity of ideology, of political thought, and the question is, how do you, how do you navigate that in the workplace as a leader? And I, I think the, the response that you made about really you're going back to your values as an organization and your company and be grounded there, but also think of yourself uh, you know, as creating a place where people all have a sense of belonging. They want to work there and they want to work for you because they believe they're just as important as the other person in the organization. So for me, I think it's really teaching leaders uh, to be learners, to, to be vulnerable, to step into those places because we, we, we're, we're moving into an area where uh, it's, it's quite uh, politically uh, charged. Um, mm. One of the things that uh, I, I'll say this and then I'll stop is that I think in, in the diversity space, we've, we've learned to play the offensive game pretty well uh, in terms of moving the needle forward, but we haven't really addressed or dealt with the issue of defense. You know, what are we doing when those forces, those behaviors, those things that are, are pushing against what you're trying to do to create an inclusive organization? So be thoughtful about those things in terms of behaviors, reactions, and I'd say the more you stay grounded in your values and beliefs as an organization, I think the more likely you're gonna be successful in that area. You know, I think it goes to, you know, a CEO having a diverse leadership team as well um, from the top is very important. I think that it's, it would be great for anyone, just like we all do on smaller teams and down at the, the work will be level it's about collaborating and it's about talking to someone and, and bouncing ideas off of people and things like that. So I think that having, your diverse, having diversity in your leadership team where the CEO himself can actually bounce ideas off of people and kind of work through those different things, things ideas as well as um, issues that's going on can be brought up and that person can say, you know what, I think this is something we, we may want to address or not address or those type of things. So I think that, but me personally, I, um, I recently had the opportunity to hear um, the new F5 CEO talk, and he talked specifically about diversity. And I've had, you know, this gentleman I've seen speak a few times. I've seen Sarah Bird um, speak numerous times on this. And what I would love to see is just more CEOs in general. Um, even some of the bigger companies' CEOs talk about diversity and why it's important for their company in general and get that out 
and mainstream. I mean, I hear it from a news standpoint, but what about specifically CEOs? I hear a lot of talk about automation and the lack of jobs and things in that area. And this conversation diversity has been on, on like really mainstream for since 2014, right? So I wanna hear more CEOs talking about that and being involved. The ones that are actually involved, <coughs> which you see here, they, they're, they have better companies because of it and they're advocates for it. They're, it's never been a person that I know that has diversified things and said, man, that sucked. I really I wish, yeah, like, wow, like that sucked. Every single person who's ever done this, they're like, wow, not only is my company better, I'm better from this. And so yeah. to me, I think all of the, we have a lot of fear and things and fear holds us back from doing a lot of things. So it goes back to the courage to step up and say, you know what? I don't care about even making a mistake. I'm trying to do the right thing and my intention is to do the right thing. If I stumble or make a mistake there, I can say I apologize and I'm sorry. My intention was really good, you know, and I'm moving this needle forward. So to me, I just think that it's, it's really time to get some, some balls and start I'll really bring doing those. things. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's just like literally, and I think that, um, you know, CEOs, when you, when you speak out about these type of things, your employees listen. I mean, we want to please you. We want a promotion, we want more money, we want all these different things. So I think it's, uh, it would be, when I start seeing this from some of the leaders in this industry, I will start smiling because I truly think then that's when things are really gonna start moving. So I, I wanna say, yes, that's true. Um, and for me, it needs to go beyond leaders saying we have diversity goals and we're upset about the pipeline and I wish we had more women in the blah, blah, blah. And like, I, that's good and we, we should see that, we should hear it. Um, I think that is going to continue to feel really, really hollow to every underrepresented minority or woman in the workplace until you have, if the trust isn't there, if you just mm -hmm. say those words, until you actually also say things like, um, hey, the behavior that um, happened um, with Harvey Weinstein being able to perpetuate those behaviors, even though it's not our industry, it's not our company, but being able to say something yes. publicly, mm -hmm. hey, that is terrible. Right. This is a real problem, and men need to step up to fix it. And mostly men are in the boardroom, and mostly men are the perpetrators, and men need to step up to fix this. Like, how powerful is that to the women in your org? Mm -hmm. It's not to say, we have a goal to hire diverse candidates, and we're going to improve our parental leave policy by a month. But to have a public statement that's like, full stop, there's a bigger national conversation. Or to have a, how would you feel if you're a person of color, and you're, in theory, everyone is like, hey, come to tech, it's inclusive, we want you here. And then complete radio silence on what is happening to our African-American colleagues, friends, communities in this country right now, and the conversation going around right now, the quality of that national conversation. Like, how can you, be, how can you have authentic trust? Mm -hmm. and not, so you can't say, oh, I want more people of color. Radio silence that they're being killed. Exactly. You, can't, you, have, to, you have to step into that. And so, the, so for me, that courage piece is, and where we as leaders got to embrace values and try to make it apolitical and say this is a values issue about human dignity. And I want to go on the record about human dignity. Yes. And this is a broader thing. Yet, and that, I think, is the kind of leadership that gives me chills and goosebumps. Yes. And it's it. so inspiring. And will make it not just be a diversity statement and not just a target number, but a genuine we see ourselves as part of a larger fabric and we're, we are drawing a line about how we want to be in this I, world. I know of, of the diversity initiatives that, that we've done at Zillow Group, one of the things that feels most impactful to people is that, is leaders just saying, gosh, this must be hard, what's happening outside of work, yeah. so and true. we feel this and we support you. Yeah. And you know, these days it feels like those messages have to go out a lot, but they do. Um, and, and it makes a difference to people. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Yeah. I mean, know that as an African-American professional and just African-American in this country, it's very, it's, this past couple of years have been a really tough. Yeah. It's been really tough. It's something every week and you're like, wow. The perception is that mm -hmm. we're just not wanted here, right? Mm -hmm. And those are things that we, we deal with on a daily basis and we smile and we go it, but Inside, you know, I have kids, so I'm, I'm worried about them. And, and, and other people are worried about, we're worried about our kids. And honestly, the truth of the matter is, is that all everybody wants is a fair opportunity to provide for their family 
And that's the reason why we built this country in the first place, right? To give that fair opportunity so that everyone can have that pursuit of happiness. And so, I mean, know that if you're not saying anything, my company, they don't say anything about it. And mm -hmm. us as employees, we talk about it sometimes, but a lot of times it's just like, no one from the leadership is really saying it, and so it's, it doesn't feel right in the office, right? It doesn't feel right. It feels like, mm. But know that the people you're working around, people of color with everything that's going to meeting, uh, in the media, they're feeling it. They are a little bit worried, a little bit nervous about what's going on in our country today. There's one, one challenge that I, I, I want to offer and throw out to this particular community because I think more than other communities, you are going to play a very significant role over the next few years in terms of the messaging, the work that gets done at organizations like Facebook and Google and so forth. And we're seeing now artificial intelligence being used as either something that's helpful or hurtful. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as, you, as you build your systems and processes and platforms, I think it's gonna be incumbent on you to really focus on those to ensure that they're being inclusive, value added, and not hurtful. Because what we're seeing now emerging through artificial intelligence are, uh, are, are ways in which people are using it in a way that I don't believe it was originally intended. So I would just challenge you to, as you think about diversity, don't just think about the workforce and the workplace, but think about the products and services that you are providing America. They'll either help us or hurt us. Thank you all. We've unfortunately have to wrap yeah. up. I feel like we could talk for hours. Very quickly, I can I just ask Ephinus and Eric, um, for people in the room who want um, conversations and consulting on this subject to understand how they can impact their um, companies, can you just say very quickly your organizations and, and how you can help? Uh, there, there are two. If you're interested in the series for next year, uh, Barbara and I have cards, the Institute for Sustainable Diversity and an Inclusion, and my, my consulting practice is HendaWorks. Uh, just write my name, Ephinus, and Google it, and you'll find me on the web. <laughs> uh, uh, Eric Osborne, here Seattle. Um, really simple, here, each H-E-R-E, -E, Seattle. You can look us up on the web. Um, Definitely, I invite you guys to come to an event. Um, we definitely do a, uh, we provide really good events, um, very diverse, so everyone's welcome, and we do a great job of that. So I invite you to come down. To, Thank you, to everyone. Check us out. Thank Thanks. you.